Hello and welcome to the first lesson on subsidies. In this session we're going to have a look at what they're used for, the types of market failure they are used to correct and exactly what they are. We're going to have a look at a proper definition. So first of all time to think. So I want you to write down for each of the following causes of market failure two things you know about each of those market failures. It could be that it causes underconsumption, overconsumption, or maybe something about a market where we typically see these types of market failures. If you pause the video and then replay when you're ready, we can compare answers. So hopefully you've got something in each of the boxes. Let's have a look and see how your answers compare to mine. So let's start with information gaps. Information gaps is where one party to the transaction has a lot more information than the other. We often think about merit goods and due to a lack of information, we don't realize just how beneficial these merit goods are to the wider society. So take a vaccination program. If I had a vaccination, I may not be aware of just how many people I will not go on to infect for the rest of my life as a result of having that vaccination. So they are often under consumed in a free market. Positive externalities are positive impacts on third parties as a result of consumption or production. So think of positive externalities as spillover benefits. And because the benefits to society are greater than to the private individual, not enough is provided in the free market. There is either under consumption or under production. Labour immobility is having labour not in the right place. So it can be either geographical or occupational. If it's geographical, we might have vacancies in one area of the economy, but unemployed people in another area of the economy, and we can't match the two up. Now that could be because of poor transport or lack of transport or expensive transport or commuting times, or it could be because of house prices being so different in those two areas. It could be occupational immobility, and this is where the vacancies that exist uh, are not appropriate for those unemployed, the skills of those that are unemployed. So take, for example, we might have vacancies for software developers, but the unemployed individuals we're looking at might have marketing and sales skills. And so the vacancies continue to exist and there is labor immobility. Public goods have two main characteristics. They are non-rival, and non-excludable. You may also learn about non-rejectability. This leads to the free rider problem, which in turn leads to a complete market failure as there is no financial incentive at all for an individual private firm to supply that good or service because free riders come and use the product without paying for it. Last but not least, we're going to look at natural monopoly. And this is an industry that has enormous economies of scale um, that are achievable. But it might be that the domestic market or the market that we're looking at can only achieve some or partial economies of scale so that the average cost or unit cost tends to be too high for the firm to be profitable. And this in turn will lead to underproduction by that firm. So in all these examples, market failure could be corrected by providing subsidies because subsidies help to lower a firm's costs of production. And in turn, we hope they pass that on in the form of a reduced market price. So let's formalize what is a subsidy. It's any form of government support. It can be financial, which is the usual case, or otherwise, and it is offered to producers in 99.9% .9 of the cases. Because it's offered to producers, it tends to shift, or it will shift the supply curve to the right. And if you imagine a demand and supply curve with the supply shifting to the right because of lower costs of production, this will increase output 
and lead to a lower equilibrium market price. The subsidy will also lead to an increase in producer surplus and consumer surplus, and we'll be looking at that in due course. So let's have a look at a few examples. Subsidies or economic and social welfare, welfare can be used to help poorer families, for example, with food and childcare costs, childcare is subsidised. It can be used to encourage output and investment in fledgling sectors. So those sectors that have yet to achieve the economies of scale and have yet to get established and increase their output sufficiently. So it, they help them out and in due course, we hope that the subsidies will be withdrawn. Subsidies can be used to project jobs, protect jobs in loss making industries, such as those hit by recession. So during the Brexit negotiations, we heard uh, during that uncertain period that a lot of our key industries, such as car manufacturing industries, were offered subsidies to protect jobs during that time. Subsidies are used to make some healthcare treatments more affordable, some prescription drugs, so that more people can remain healthy. They're used to reduce the cost of training and employing workers, so that firms are encouraged to actually conduct training, therefore increasing productivity, increasing the productive potential of the economy, or just to employ workers to reduce unemployment. They're used to uh, redistribute income, so helping out subsidies are given uh, to lower income families and lower income households to enable them to increase their standard of living. They're used to reduce some external costs of transport to encourage greater consumption of public transport, reducing congestion and reducing pollution, again correcting market failure. And they are used to encourage arts and other cultural services. So, for example, many museums are free to enter or many art exhibitions are heavily subsidised to encourage greater consumption of these.